Hi. Welcome back. All 77 of you. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine, when you're not really fine, you just can't get into it because they would never understand. It's kind of crazy to think that 77 people like my videos enough, like my rambling enough to think, yeah, I'm going to watch more of that stuff. So here I am making more. On a serious note, if you are one of my 77 subscribers, thank you very much because thank you very much. I have nothing. I have no because. So yeah, I'm back for some more rambling this time about chaos. Now, Chaos gets a bad rap, I think. People think of chaos and they think of the end of the world, they think of volcanoes erupting and earthquakes, but chaos is something that is around us all the time. You, know, you can't control everything, and sometimes things do go out of control. But the thing is, humans are pretty great at dealing with chaos. But when I talk about chaos, I mean a particular kind of chaos. If you have chaos in your family life, chaos in your relationships, chaos in your sleeping patterns or in your diet, it can have pretty bad effects. But in when we're talking about movement, chaos can have a really interesting positive effect. And the reason is that humans are designed to deal with chaos and we learn a lot from it. We, we learn a hell of a lot. I mean, just, just think of babies. Babies are just kind of, you just, they're just around and everything for them is chaos. They have no idea what's going on. Everything around them is just insane and crazy and new, and somehow they learn. I think, you know, you're probably not a baby. Maybe you are a baby. That would be amazing. If you're a baby and you're watching this video, then well done to you. But I doubt you're a baby. So, just make sure this is still right. So, as I was saying before I went on the baby tangent, humans work really well with chaos because our environments were always chaos. And again, not bad chaos, like chaos is, chaos is a scary word and it doesn't mean that literally everything is chaos, but it's more like the interactions we have with, with our environment. So let's use an example to understand what I mean by humans had chaos all around them all of the time. Imagine this. You're hungry and you think, oh, I should probably cook dinner soon. There's no food in the house, so you think, okay, I'll just go to the shops. But then you realise that it's not 2019, it's actually 10,000 BC. So you go to leave your house, and that's when you remember, because it's 10,000 BC, you don't have a house, you have a tiny hut, if you're lucky, if you decided to build a hut, because you had to build it yourself. So you go, oh, oh okay, well, whatever, I'll just walk to the shops. So you start walking on the road, and that's when you remember, there, there's no road, there's no road at all. But you think, okay, I can, do, I can deal without the road, I can deal without the path, so I just, I'll just keep walking. And then you get to a river, and you go to cross the bridge, and you remember, oh, shit, there's no bridge. Oh. So you, you swim across the river, and then you get to the other side, and then you realise, oh, wait, because there's no roads and there's no buildings, everything around me is a forest, or mountainous, and difficult to get through, so you struggle through all this stuff. And then you get to the shops, and because it's 10,000 BC, there's no shops, obviously. I mean, I, I can't believe you forgot this. In fact, how could you forget it because you never knew what a shop was in the first place? But anyway, <laughs> this is a really, really stupid example, but I'm going to stick with it now because I've started. So yeah, you get to the non-existent shops and you realise, ah, oh, I'm going to get my own food. So you weave yourself a basket and you make yourself a bow and arrow. At that point though, you realise, oh, I don't have any clothes. Like maybe you have some furs, you probably don't have any shoes, you're just, you're basically naked. So you're running barefoot through the forest, through the mountains, through wherever, chasing after animals. And then after you spent hours hunting and gathering, you have to get back home. And yeah, you're carrying a dead animal, you're carrying a bunch of foraged food, and you have to walk miles back to your home. Oh yeah, and you have to cross that river again. That's the kind of chaos that I mean. That's the kind of chaos that would just be part of everyday life. You, it's the kind of chaos you just don't experience in modern day life. Walking down a path, a concrete path that's just perfectly flat, just isn't the same. 
It doesn't affect you in the same way. But humans are really good at dealing with that kind of environment. Not modern humans, obviously, but our bodies are the same bodies of prehistoric humans and they were really good at dealing with it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. And it, it's more than just like the obvious things. Like it's a subtle detail. Like when, when you have to walk through terrain that has no paths, everything is hard. Every movement is difficult because there is no, there's no easy footing. Everything's wobbly. Everything's wonky. There's always a tree or a bush in the way. The ground might be soft. The amount of times I've tried to walk off the path and just sunk ankle deep into mud. It's just constant and it just drains your energy and you never get grip and you're, you're constantly twisting your ankle. And when I say twisting your ankle, twisting your ankle is quite a modern thing because people that are constantly on uneven terrain just don't really have particularly weak ankles. You don't, it's very difficult to actually twist your ankle once you've done all of this crazy off-roading because your ankles are so strong that even if you do twist it, they're just going, eh, eh, whatever, carry on, we're going to get home. But people nowadays, they're constantly rolling their ankles. It's like an endless thing of, oh, I rolled my ankle the other day. I'll be out for a few weeks. <sighs> Come on, autofocus. Yeah, back to my face here. Autofocus. Autofocus. Where are you going? Come on, autofocus. You've got this. No, that's not it at all. No. Come on, autofocus. Come on. Come on, autofocus. Come on. No, that's really not it. It's tracking, you're tracking my face. I can see it. You've got a fucking tracking thing around my face. Focus. What's happened? Where have you gone? Why aren't you focusing? What's happening? Oh, oh, found me. Yay, well done. <sighs> so, I'm talking about how historically humans were great at dealing with chaos and complexity and variability. But what does that mean for us now? We don't have to deal with these things as much anymore. So is there any point adding them back into our lives? Well, the answer in general is yes, because even though it doesn't feel like it, there will be times where chaos will happen in your life and you will have no choice. You just have no option, it will happen. And those are the moments where you really need to have experienced chaos and complexity on a lower level before you get the extreme end. Say, say you, you know, say you walk to work, or you walk to anywhere, it doesn't matter where you're walking, and you get there and you spend some time there, a few hours, and then when you leave, it's icy like sheet ice, you know, it's rained and then it's frozen over, which, you know, in England happens fairly regularly in the winter. In other countries, it happens much more often. Can you deal with that? Can you deal with the fact that the surface you're standing on is suddenly just like ice, slick, no grip at all? Can you deal with that? Or are you going to fall over and hurt, hurt, and hurt yourself and hurt yourself? Or are you going to fall over and hurt yourself? What happens if you are out on a cruise and fall into the sea? Now, you might be able to swim a mile in the pool, but can you swim anywhere in the cold sea? Have you even tried? Do you know? Do you know if you'll be able to do that? What if the building you're in sets on fire? Can you climb down the outside? Can you get to the roof to be rescued by the fire brigade? Can you do anything or will you just be trapped? Now, this is going to sound kind of bad to old people, but it's happened to my family. It's happened to some people I know. We all know that old person who's just given up. They just, you know, they've, they've got injured at some point, they've had a hip replacement and they just decide, oh, who cares? Who cares? It's fine. I'll just have a mobility scooter. That's like the extreme end of not dealing with chaos. Things go downhill and they get downhill and downhill and they get downhill faster and faster and faster until you get to the point where you cannot deal with any chaos. If you have to use a Zimmer frame or a walking stick or a mobility scooter, that limits your ability to deal with chaos so much, suddenly you're completely trapped within the whims of the people around you or the environment around you. And you know what? If you're one of these older people or one of the younger people that have just lost the ability to deal with chaos, I'm not trying to be horrible to you. This isn't what this video is about. It's not to whinge at people that have lost the ability to deal with chaos, but instead 
to try and help you, to try and help you understand what you might be lacking and then to give you a bit of a guide on what you can do. So that's this portion of the video, the guiding bit. So yeah, now we've talked about why chaos is beneficial, let's talk about how to implement chaos in a safe way. Because if you've not dealt with any chaos in your life, any complexity and variability, then it's going to be scary and potentially dangerous. So if at the moment you do almost no movement at all, then start doing something. And when I say something, I mean literally almost anything. Go for a walk. Just regularly go for a walk. If at the moment you don't go for any walks, go for a walk twice a week. And I don't mean a walk out in a, a hike in the mountains. I just mean go outside and walk around and get used to being in whatever temperature it is and whatever weather it is and just get used to getting out and moving again or go swimming or start some kind of beginner class doing something, get moving again. Because the first step is to just get movement back into your body again, because if you deprive your body of movement, it will forget how to use itself, you know, use it or lose it. It's right there in the phrase. But if you're already a mover of some kind, which from what I can tell, most of the people that watch my videos and most of the people that follow me on Instagram are, then you probably already have some movement in your life. So let's talk about progressing it. So I'm just going to go through a few progressions that you can use. Progressions from particular activities you may already do to other activities that are similar in what you get from them, but provide more chaos, more complexity and variability and all those fancy words that I've used multiple times now. And obviously I can't say for every single starting point ever, like, oh, you do basketball, so then you should move from basketball to this, to this, to this. But hopefully this will kind of cover the general things that lots of people do. And then from there, if it doesn't apply to you, hopefully you can understand where I'm coming from with increasing the level of complexity and add it into your life using your own brain. <laughs> using your own brain. That's a useful skill, actually. Use your own brain. Pro tip from Billy. Yeah, so like I said, start off just by going for a walk and doing basic things. But once you're, you know, regularly going for a walk, what can you do to increase the complexity of that? Well, the first thing I do is take it off the concrete path. Just start by, you know, wearing something that you don't mind getting muddy or something that's good for dealing with mud and start walking on the grass or on the mud or going onto, you know, just just slightly off the beaten track. You don't have to, like, it doesn't mean you have to go out into the forest, you know, commune with the trees. Just, just when there's a patch of grass next to the concrete, walk on the grass instead. And then the obvious progression from that is once you've walked off the path for a while, once you're used to walking on the grass and you're comfortable, start going out a little bit further. Start walking A, longer distances if you have time, and B, on slightly rougher surfaces, you know, trails, tracks, you know, nothing super crazy, just not quite as soft and gentle as the grass. Then what? From there, um, go on to kind of rougher tracks, you know, like, like you would if you're going hiking out in the hills, you know, those kind of out of the way paths, the the smaller ones, the less the less beaten tracks. And then finally what I recommend is once you've really toughened your body up to the complexities of walking on more difficult terrain, pick a direction. Go to a forest and just pick a direction and walk that way. Not on the path, not on any kind of track, just walk and see how difficult it is and how complex it is to deal with the environment around you. It won't be long before you come against a tree that you're gonna to have to crawl under or branches you're gonna to have to push out of the way. Yeah, give it a try and see what it's like. It is much harder than you'd expect it to be. It's so, so much harder than even being on a difficult to walk trek. It's so much more difficult. Okay, so what if you like swimming? What if you go swimming regularly? You do lengths of the pool, you know, whatever. How do you add complexity to that? Well. I'm not going to say you should stop going to the swimming pool because if it's your local place to go swimming, then great. But what you could do is, for instance, you could go swimming in the wild, go swimming in a lake, go swimming in a slow moving river. Nothing too crazy, nothing that's going to, you know, completely throw you off. But maybe the temperature isn't perfect. 
maybe it moves slightly, maybe there's some waves and some ripples, just adding a little bit more in. Once you've done that, I would recommend, obviously you can't always do this, but if you can, go for a swim in the sea. And I don't mean go on like a stormy day, but go for a swim in the sea. Obviously look up all the stuff about currents and tides, things like that, so you don't get dragged out. But you know, I used to live by the sea. It's not, it sounds scary if you haven't been there before, but it's not, it's, it's really safe. But just get used to the fact that the waves are gonna throw you up and down and jolt you side to side. And it, again, it's completely different swimming in the sea into a swimming pool. And then finally, again, this is once you are very, very confident, you can go for something a bit more exciting, you know, go out to the sea when it's really wavy, you know, and it's splashing and throwing all over the place or a river that's going quite fast. Again, very carefully and almost definitely with other people because you don't want to be there on your own and get flipped over by a wave and start drowning or anything. But this again, this is the extreme end. Once you're very confident in your movement and your ability, you can add more complexity in by dealing with that. So what about people that go to the gym and you walk in the gym and there's machines everywhere. So obviously you're just gonna use the machines, right? Well, machines are really the opposite of chaos and complexity. Machines, gym machines are actually very, very rigid with what they do. They pretty much only allow you to train one muscle or one group of muscles at a time. So what can we do to add a bit more chaos to that? There's kind of two paths you can take. Obviously you should probably do both, but there are two paths. One path is that you start doing free weights and it can be really, really scary. You know, go in the weight room, there's all these buff men and women around there just lifting stuff that you couldn't imagine lifting. But it is so much better for your body to lift free weights. When you're lifting free weights, like barbells and dumbbells and you know, that kind of thing, you have to constantly support what you're doing, not that you can see. I'm gonna lay down, hopefully. You don't get too much. If you're, oh, hello. <laughs> so if you're laying on a bench, doing a bench press, if you're using a machine to do the bench press position, it holds it steady for you the whole time. But if you're doing a bench press with a free weight, you have to stop it from falling side to side or backwards and forwards. And it's a challenge and it adds that extra depth into your movement that, that you wouldn't have if you were using a machine. The other side of things that I recommend if you go to the gym and use machines is to start doing some body weight calisthenics, you know, push-ups, pull-ups. Start, start off with the basics, you know, you, I'm not gonna go through a whole guide of all the basic calisthenics moves now, but go look it up. There's tons of guys on like the begin, beginner calisthenics moves. Start there, start just getting away from the machines because the machines are designed to make you do one specific thing and what they are designed to be is safe and that's great if you're a gym because you want your insurance cost to be really low but it's not great if you're a human because you can be just as safe doing free weights as long as you pay attention and you don't do anything stupid and use too much weight and it's the same with calisthenics as long as you don't do anything stupid that's way out of your range you'll be fine it's not scary. Okay, it might be a bit scary at first, but it won't be scary once you've had some practice. So carrying on with free weights. Once you've used free weights, what can you do then? Well, what you can do is start trying to find reasons or excuses or just set it up for yourself to lift unusual shaped objects in real life. You know, lifting up a sofa or carrying a rock or carrying logs on your shoulders. And you know what? The best thing you could do is be that really helpful guy that when somebody says, oh, could you help me load up this moving van? I'm moving to a different flat or a moving house in a few weeks. Go help them. Be that guy or that woman. Be that person that's like, yeah, I'll help you load stuff up. And then just carry that shit, you know? You're big, you're strong, you can do it. And it, again, it's such a different experience from lifting free weights because suddenly you haven't got this thing that's a perfect, you know, bar that you can grip onto. Suddenly you've got things that are a weird shape like this, I don't know. This round piece of metal, like, you know, trying to carry that, it's nowhere near as easy as lifting like a barbell. Like, how are you gonna do bicep curls with this? It's just gonna fall out of your hand. Why have I got a round piece of metal here? Who knows? I don't know. I've just got it here. <laughs> yeah, so try and find things to lift that aren't easily lifted. They aren't designed to be lifted. They're a bit more of a complex shape. 
And again, this could be something you set up yourself. You could put a bunch of logs and stones in your back garden to lift, or it could be just everyday life, you know, find excuses to, you know, I don't know, move your furniture around in your house, anything. So going back to calisthenics again, it's literally just using your body weight, using your body weight to do exercise. But how can you make that more chaotic? You can make it more chaotic by going, you know, one of two ways or combining them. So the two ways would be you could start climbing, like rock climbing, or you could start doing something like parkour. Parkour obviously being body weight, but jumping, running, striding, vaulting, that kind of thing. Climbing being body weight, but you're trying to climb up a, um, climb up a set of poles on a wall. And I might be biased because I'm a parkour climber. I do parkour and I do climbing. But, you know, I think for, they really, to me, feel like the two most chaotic activities that you could do, but in a good way. But then you can still go one step further from that. You don't just have to go climbing a, um, a climbing wall. You can go climbing out in nature. You can go natural rock climbing. And again, it takes it a step further. Suddenly you've got the weather to deal with. Suddenly you've got the fact that holds in nature aren't designed for human hands. They're just whatever there's there. What a, they're just whatever's there. You have to deal with that. And then with parkour, again, go out into nature. You can do natural parkour. Doing these kind of parkour-esque movements in nature because again suddenly the landing surfaces are slippery the surfaces you're running and jumping on aren't as grippy or they're different textures they're different angles adding more complexity the one more way you can add more chaos for your body is by doing lots of different sports now i don't think sports are perfect they they are limited in their own ways but if you decide to do lots of different sports, it kind of normally, unless you pick very similar sports, adds up in such a way that you have a lot of different movements going on. And yeah, it's quite... So for instance, you know, if you do football at the moment, you could go, oh, I'm going to do football and I'm going to go do some CrossFit and I'm going to go do some climbing and I'm going to do some martial arts. And you combine those four things and suddenly you've got quite a diverse range of movements that you're doing on a daily basis and with their own chaotic elements and your body will learn very quickly. In fact, there is a huge effect from cross training on your performance, your sporting performance. So I'm not gonna go into that in this video, but yeah, try and vary what you do. If you at the moment only do one sport, do 10. Maybe not 10 because you probably can't fit all them in, but you know, fit more in. Do, do more different sports instead of one of the same sport. And on that though, I think I'm going to end this video here. I don't think I'm going to end this video here. I know I'm going to end this video here. Um, if you stuck around to the end, thank you very much. Um, I really hope you enjoyed this video and, and I hope that you enjoyed it enough that you'll increase that count to the subscribers from 77 to 78. Because that's my plug for subscriptions. And while you're there, when you press the subscribe button, a little bell will come up next to it. And if you press that bell, then you get a notification when I upload a video. And that means you really love me. So maybe you don't want to do that. But anyway, I'd recommend you do that. Oh, and while you're there, like it and um, comment and share it with all your friends and do all those annoying things that every YouTuber has to say at the end of every video. But anyway, thank you very much. And I'm going to go now. Bye. Are you outside my door, darling? <laughs>